my name is Sarah Campbell. A very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining today's session on drinks performance in Asia. So a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to have a look at how beverage alcohol performed in 2021 and how that stacks up versus pre-pandemic. We'll also then drive into some of the consumer trends behind uh, consumption patterns, looking at low and no alcohol, the RTD category, and then also looking at the online channel. We'll wrap up with uh, the IWS view on uh, what we think the future looks like and then a summary of some of the key takeaways. So let's jump straight in. So the big question on everyone's lips at the moment is very much, has the beverage alcohol market fully recovered from the pandemic? So here we're looking at volume and value sales for total beverage alcohol. So tracked from 2016 and forecasted out to 2026. We have volume sales in the orange line and value in blue. So what we do see in 2020 is obviously a significant decline in volume sales, but then we do start seeing into 2021 a rebound. So this year we saw a 3% increase in volume sales. What's potentially more impressive and also quite surprising is the 12% increase that we've seen in value sales, which means that value sales in 2021 have actually surpassed that of 2019. So really, you know, that highlights the fact that beverage alcohol is an incredibly resilient category, even when it's been faced with an unprecedented combination of challenges. And it really enforces the fact that, uh, you know, alcohol is now really seen and um, by shoppers as being an affordable luxury and a key part of their basket. So if we move on, um, one of the key questions that we're being asked by many brand owners is, you know, are we starting to get back to the uh, normal pre-COVID trends? But when we drill down to a category level from a volume perspective, we can look at it with the 2019 volumes here in the Navy, 2020 and then 2021. And what we do see is that in the vast majority of cases, um, volumes are either in line or still behind that of 2019. That's, of course, with the exception of RTDs, but we'll discuss that uh, further shortly. If we drill down into some of the categories, we can have a look at uh, beer, for example. So it has recovered about half of the volumes that it lost in 2020, growing slightly above what we had forecasted. That's driven by ongoing growth in Brazil, a strong rebound in Mexico and Colombia, and we're starting to see some green shoots in China as well. The vast majority of growth that we have seen come through in spirits has really been driven by uh, premium uh, categories, so tequila and scotch, and also premium price bands as well. What we have seen, however, is quite a few allocation issues, um, specifically with premium and above products. And, um, you know, not just in uh, small countries, but large markets having trouble getting enough stock. So that really suggests that actually if availability had been stronger, that growth could have been stronger as well. What we're also seeing is at the other end of the scale in spirits is some rebound of lower end products. So within India, um, a bit of resurgence within uh, value, whiskey, rum and brandy, and also gin in the Philippines. We're also seeing lower energy occasions becoming increasingly popular, and that's very much in line with um, the kind of advent of home cocktails. So we've seen uh, flavoured spirits drive uh, really strong growth of uh, about 11 percent, and that's um, in line with you know uh, a lot of liqueurs coming through and people really experimenting at home. We've also seen a nice performance of vermouth and wine aperitifs, so really that lower tempo um, occasion. In RTDs, we have seen growth really gather pace in FABs, particularly in Japan and China. And then we've seen cocktails and long drinks really see an, an uptick in both Japan and the USA. The big story, obviously, of 2020 was hard seltzers in the USA, and they have continued to grow, but it's definitely at a more moderate pace than what it had been. And last but not least, um, cider performed well above expectations, actually, um, and had a really strong performance in South Africa, which is its second largest market globally and delivered kind of 50 percent year on year sales. So if we look at this uh, same picture, but in a value story, it tells a very, very different uh, dialogue. And we see really the importance of premiumization trend with 2021 figures outstripping 2019 across all categories. One of the key ones to look at for us as a kind of standout was wine. Um, we saw very, very strong performance in sparkling wine with champagne up almost 24%, which is incredible for obviously a very premium category, but also one that's been around for a long time. 
And we've also seen sparkling wines up over 7.5%. So both of those categories have outperformed 2019 levels in value terms. Another thing that we've seen has been um, an ongoing definitive shift with the less but better trend in still wine. So whilst we saw volume down 2%, we've seen value go up 5% globally, which really underpins a clear consumer change in behaviour. So if we move on to look at regions, this is a view that we quite like to share um, to kind of show recovery by region. Um, and when we break it down, in general, we can see that the vast majority of regions experienced decline of some extent in 2019 and 2020 during the initial COVID outbreak. The vast majority have seen a subsequent recovery and are forecast to deliver growth over the next five years. One of the major anomalies um, that kind of stood out from the pack was very much in North America, where actually during COVID there was a really significant sales increase, um, but we're now seeing TBA growth rates soften quite significantly. Um, what we're seeing that be driven by is uh, actually beer performance, which accounts for about 70% of the total market volume. So if beer doesn't perform well, the total category is dragged down. Focusing in on Asia Pacific, we have started to see some great signs of recovery. Obviously, for 2021, that has been somewhat tempered by the comparatively late reopening of borders versus other regions. And then obviously the ongoing lockdowns in China. So if we hone in on uh, spirits in APAC, specifically by price band, we can see that the vast majority of growth is being driven by super premium and above segments. However, we need to note that this does include the kind of very, very large national spirits category, of which Baijiu is obviously a significant proportion. And we are seeing ongoing value volume decline at the lower quality levels. So it's worth noting that if we actually strip this out, which we've done, and then look at the picture excluding national spirits, we can see that premiumization really is alive and well in Asia Pacific with growth across all of the standard and above price bands. And really it's only at value and below that we're seeing any decline. So the question then is what are the consumer trends that are actually driving consumption? So we're in a very uncertain time, as we all know, the uh, drinks industry is uh, leaning into some quite significant headwinds, which are going to be very relevant for this year and probably uh, likely fall into the medium term as well. Obviously, we have inflation and the increased cost of living. We've got consumers across the world suffering from the rising cost of living, which realistically is going to have significantly more impact on people in emerging and developing economies where a more significant proportion of their uh, food spend is a higher proportion of their income. We then also have supply chain disruption and rising uh, input costs. So, you know, we're very aware of the fact that in some instances, uh, container rates have increased by a factor of five or 10, also significant shipping delays, which has a knock-on effect in terms of out of stocks. Also seeing real challenges in terms of sourcing glass, labeling, glue, even CO2 for carbonation. So, um, you know, that, that's an, an ongoing issue for uh, brand owners in terms of maintaining availability. There's a view that hopefully shipping should stabilize somewhat within the next 12 months, but obviously only time will tell. And lastly, we look at regionalization. So we're definitely, um, with the impact of supply chain challenges, seeing some unwinding of uh, global supply chains per se. Definitely they won't be completely unpicked, but we are seeing manufacturers really put a lot of things in place to reduce their risk, be it uh, sorting bottles locally um, or other dry goods. And obviously that in then has an impact in terms of baking in a higher uh, cost into the base of the products. So whilst we are um, facing into a very, very uncertain time, we have seen in previous uh, economic crises that the uh, beverage alcohol sector is actually incredibly resilient. So if we look at what we think some of the key drivers are going to be for the future, we've talked about premiumization, and that's obviously something which is an incredibly important dynamic, particularly coming through in core spirits and wine categories in developed markets. 
Better for me is a topic which um, encompasses a, a very wide range of things. It would be overly simplistic to say that it's just about low and no alcohol. It's, it's not. People are a lot more conscious about what they're putting into their bodies. So there's a real focus on, you know, the, the quality of ingredients, provenance. You know, people are talking about low calorie, but increasingly low carb within beers, looking at gluten free. And also then looking at, um, you know, functional ingredients like nootropics. So um, really a, a very, a very broad part of um, the category. Linked to that, we're seeing better for the world coming out. And I think it would be fair to say that this trend has really accelerated quite substantially in the past couple of years with the huge amount of uncertainty that we've seen globally. Um, I think sustainability and, and, and social equality is no longer a thing that can kind of be kicked off as part of a marketing campaign. We're seeing uh, consumers, especially younger LDA co cohorts, really um, demand and expect that these are an integrated part of uh, a business's plan and, and how they do business on a day-to-day -day basis. We've been talking about the home premise uh, since 2020. Um, and, you know, we're very conscious of the fact that people have learned to drink better at home. Um, they have invested in you know, nice furniture, new glassware, they spent lots of money on, on liquor, they've watched master classes, you know, they feel quite confident in what they're doing now. So we really expect that to be something that sticks around. And I think especially as we see inflationary pressures come through and really squeeze people's pockets, uh, entertaining at home is potentially a much better option for, for people and could significantly impact their desire to go back into the on trade and to pay that premium. And then lastly, digital, we can't get away from it. You know, e-commerce is now a, a really key, key part of the overall channel mix. And it's something that has to, um, you know, be a really well thought out part of the uh, overall brand strategy. We then try and dive into a little bit in terms of which consumers are actually driving these trends. Um, we did some research last year looking at COVID behaviours and drinking patterns. So with the green dots looking at all TBA drinkers and then the blue dot looking at millennials. And what the uh, research really showed was that millennials are kind of the, the key, key group or cohort uh, driving the return of consumption, supported to some extent by Gen X. But what's really interesting about millennials is that um, really they were the least affected by COVID restrictions. You know, they're at an age now where they have good purchasing power, they're in good jobs, they own homes, they're having, you know, increasingly having families. Um, but they're also quite adventurous. You know, they want to try new things, they want to experiment, but also there is this focus on less but better. So we're seeing that really fit hand in hand with the premiumization trend. We have seen that Gen Z and boomers were generally a bit more subdued. I think so far that's because the Gen Z segment is reasonably small for now and also they don't have the same spending power as millennials. And then potentially for boomers, there was uh, some things around income restraints. So we move on, we'll look at what is actually driving the global momentum of no and low alcohol. So this chart essentially shows the current volumes in blue for low and no by category, and then how we think that it's going to evolve over the next five years. So on the left here, we see that uh, low, no alcohol beer will um, add the most volume for the category and already is the biggest uh, segment within the category. And then um, moving across into low alcohol wine, which has a incredibly strong tagger and is predicted to really drive the vast majority of uh, growth in that segment, with a lot of that coming from the USA. Interesting is no alcohol spirits, so currently of quite a small base, but we do expect that to have really strong growth rates moving forwards. And I think what's really interesting at the moment is seeing that there's really significant investment in that space, not just by the large multinationals with you know, really strong existing alcoholic brands, but also a number of new entrants to the market, both in a global perspective and locally. So definitely one to watch. So we wanted to dig into who actually is the low and no customer. And I think one of the key things that uh, came out of the research that we did on this was that in general, consumers are not completely abstaining from alcohol, but what they're doing is um, substituting either no or low alcohol beverages for full strength ones on certain occasions. So actually the kind of abstainers here are saying that I avoid alcohol completely, 
um, actually only accounts for about 20% of the overall cohort. In terms of how this looks by markets, you know, we see some of the more mature low and no markets such as Spain and South Africa have a lower proportion of trialers. Um, and you know that segment makes up the uh, the smallest part of, of their market. Um, in the USA, in particular, we see that you know a lot of people are trying to make more healthy lifestyle choices. So there are quite a lot of abstainers in in the states. What's quite interesting from an APAC perspective is uh, that Japan actually ends up being quite a uh, quite a significant outlier. So um, despite selling really quite significant volumes of no and low alcohol, the largest group is trialers. And, and by definition, they actually only drink uh, no, no alcohol on a very occasional basis. So kind of a slightly inverse dynamic to what we might expect. So we wanted to understand how occasions vary by consumer group um, and had a look at how, how these fit into, uh, in, into different slots. So what we see over here is, you know, the majority of uh, consumer segments are very very much rooted in uh, traditional alcohol occasions of unwinding and socialising. But what we see quite interestingly coming out is that substitutors are much more likely to be extending low and low consumption um, into daytime and into meal times, and really kind of edging away from that very traditional um, alcohol uh, occasion. So if you look at these same occasions, but we combine demographics, we find that uh, millennials and high income consumers across markets are much more likely to use uh, low and no products to um, unwind um, or kind of like post exercise. Socializing uh, occasions, you know, obviously very popular with all dynamics, but there is a particular over index whenever it comes to female drinkers. We've talked a lot about uh, different elements of uh, the category. Um, one of the key things on a, a lot of brand owners' minds at the minute is how will the RTD market evolve post-pandemic? So this chart shows the ongoing growth of the RTD category from 2019 and forecasted out to 2026, which obviously shows a, a good kind of growth overall. I think. Probably what's more interesting is looking at the evolution of some of these subcategories and the fact that we're having the introduction of hard teas, coffees, kombuchas, uh, alongside the burgeoning uh, hard seltzer segment. And I think what's what's quite interesting is, you know, we're seeing a lot of investment both by global brand owners and also local brands who are really trying to capture a you know, like wide range of consumer occasions and tastes. They're trying to give them a, a lot of options in that space. So we're also seeing a number of brand line extensions from traditional uh, spirits brands. And then also a, a lot of premiumization is starting to come through in the segment as well. And particularly relevant, uh, which we saw in the press a few days ago was that uh, Coca-Cola has just announced a global partnership with Brian Foreman to create a Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola RTD. And I think that really signals the perceived relevance of the category moving forward and the levels of investment that it's attracting. Uh, focusing in on some of the top RTD growth markets. So when we look at them, um, you know, very much dominated by the USA, which globally accounts for kind of over 40% of RTD uh, volumes anyway. And then also Japan, which is just over 20%. Also some other key growth markets, which are quite relevant at the moment include China. So we'll dig into that a little bit now. So if we focus in on the split of RTDs within Asia Pacific specifically, we actually see that FABs are very, very dominant, but then we do see that hard seltzers, albeit of a small base, are growing quite strongly at the moment. So we've already mentioned the fact that Japan is a really major market for RTDs. You know, globally it represents over 185 million nine liter cases. So for it to have delivered 9% growth in 2021 was a very strong result. Um, that was driven by significant R um, MPD, but also was helped by the fact that the off trade is a very dominant part of the channel mix in Japan. So in Japan, we saw the craze for lemon flavored drinks um, continue. And interestingly now, lemon flavored beverages actually represent about half of all RTDs sold in Japan. China, uh, you know, much, much smaller in terms of volume, but it's showing a lot of dynamism. 
Um, it's very much at the moment dominated by FABs such as Rio and Power Station, but really seeing a lot of diversification coming through. So we've had Coca-Cola's Tobu Chico launch, also Corona Tropical from AB InVev. And we're also seeing more of the uh, Japanese RTDs such as Horoyoi and Lemon Duke kind of gaining some traction. And that's quite interesting in terms of the development of the category moving forwards. So we talked a lot about premiumization within spirits and wines. I think what's quite interesting is a piece of work that we uh, did recently to actually look at RTDs by price band. So if we look at this top chart, we can see that the, the volume share by price band. And really we can see kind of with the exception of uh, Germany, and that's an implication of taxation legislation, the vast majority of sales go through in either value or standard. If we then look at the bottom chart, which um, shows us the percentage split of new product launches um, in 2021, um, we can see that you know, a really significant amount of these product launches are sitting in premium. And we're even seeing an emergence in the United States of a super premium category coming through. So as we all know, a lot of trends uh, tend to start in beverage alcohol in the USA and then seed out to other markets. So obviously this is a really key dynamic to watch. So obviously a key element that has kind of been escalated and accelerated, I suppose, during COVID has been the importance of online. So we'll dig into this a little bit. So if you focus in on e-commerce, um, we're still seeing really strong growth of about 10% from 2021 to 2025 being forecast. And 2021 was still a strong year. However, it definitely didn't have the massive uplifts of 2019 to 2020. And that's kind of as it becomes a more permanent part of the channel mix, but also as you know, we start seeing shoppers increasingly return into physical stores and into the on trade. Uh, I think a really interesting point to note at this point is that uh, e-commerce has now got to the stage of being worth $33 billion. So if it was a market, it would be the equivalent of the whole beverage alcohol market in France, where it would be ranked number six in the world. So really it's become a you know, crucial element of the channel mix, especially for premium involved spirits, which we know over trade significantly online. If we drill down by country, um, just to kind of see some of the different dynamics going on. So we see the blue bar um, is the expected e-commerce value growth to 2025. And then the dots are the growth rate over the same period. So for the USA, we see, um, uh, growth much faster, but that's coming from a lower base. Um, so the USA is expected to add the most value from an e-commerce perspective to 2025. China, um, we're expecting to see still significant growth coming through, but obviously that's growing off a much more significant base. So we don't expect the growth rate to be just as punchy. Uh, if we look across, you know, the other the other markets that have been identified, we're seeing high levels of growth, which obviously just very slightly depending um, on. on the uh, kind of ex extent of category development. And then just to explain the UK one, so, um, you know, the UK already had a very, uh, you know, well-developed e-commerce and had particularly strong growth in 2020 because the online grocers were able to, uh, you know, like ramp up demand very, very quickly. So it means that we've seen a bit of a correction in 2021 um, from that real kind of pandemic peak. So we, um, we see, kind of expect then for it to bounce back and we'll start seeing some growth coming back through again in the UK. So what do we mean by online channel distinctions? Um, contextually, uh, we at the IWS are split the e-commerce channel into five sub-channels. So we talk about omni-channel, online specialists, marketplaces, on-demand and direct to consumer. Um, and the key takeaway really from this chart is if you, if you look at it uh, in, in a kind of slightly more arty way, is that, you know, the um, huge variation is the key standby. And there have been really significant differences in how beverage al alcohol e-commerce has evolved, um, really meaning that, you know, there, there's no standard model. So for example, if we look at China, you know, we see the huge dominance of uh, marketplaces such as JD.com and Tmall coming through. But then if we look at places like LATAM, so Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, um, you know, places where the delivery infrastructure is considerably less developed and we see on-demand players, um, you know, playing a much, much more key role in filling this gap. 
So I think really the key takeaway from this has to be that a bespoke e-commerce strategy is needed for every single market, you know, a one size fits all solution um, just that we won't work. So we then talk about channel blur and there's a, there's a number of factors feeding into this. So, you know, we're seeing real um, real blurring of distinctions between kind of these sub channels. So for example, you know, we're seeing supermarkets partnering with on-demand businesses, for example, uh, Kroger and Instacart in the US, um, marketplaces like Amazon in the UK, you know, actually building physical grocery stores. We're also seeing new forms of selling online emerging. So, you know, things that don't necessarily fit that neatly into existing channel definitions. So we're seeing social selling in WeChat, live streaming in China, which is, um, you know, a completely different way for consumers to interact with brands. Acquisitions, obviously, are uh, increasingly relevant as well. So we had Pernod Ricard buying the Whiskey Exchange in the UK. We also have Campari and Moet Hennessy's joint venture of Tonico. So, you know, part of this thing about eroding divisions between direct-to-consumer and third-party sales. Another big one for a lot of brand owners is around business to business online sales, which are rising exponentially. So, you know, a lot of distributors focusing in this as well really pushes um, efficiency into the supply chain, you know, easier ordering, better data. So, you know, even uh, a lot of normal bricks and mortar purchases may end up having an e-commerce element at some point in the supply chain. So really the big takeout, I suppose, for the future is uh, in terms of implications, you know, there's going to be even less distinction between channels by uh, consumers. There's going to be less loyalty, be it to channels or retailers, and people are really going to choose whatever's most appropriate for them uh, in terms of each purchase and, and what their specific needs are. If you look at the platform that was actually last used for um, online alcohol purchases, so we can see that the Navy element of the bar is website, the kind of pinky color is an app. So we see, you know, in the vast majority of countries, websites are still the main platform for buying alcohol online. Um, China and Brazil really are the main or, sorry, exceptions to that. So we see greater app use broadly corresponds to markets where on demand is a, a more important e-commerce channel, although that's not quite as relevant in, in China. However, the consistent thing that we do really see within all markets is that um, younger LDA uh, consumers and those who are newer to e-commerce are far more likely to use apps. And then really you've got boomers and Gen X are much more likely to shop on websites. So the big question everyone has is what does the future look like? So um, we'll, we'll try to uh, give you our view and where we think things are heading. So this is quite a busy slide, but if we don't get too caught in the detail, this chart essentially looks at where the value pools were in TBA in 2016, and then where we think they're going to be in 2026. So if we look at global, which is the bar on the far left, one of the key highlights that we see is that we're expecting the share of spirits to go from 35 to 41%, and then RTP is going from a you know, quite nominal figure in 2016 to 5% in 2026. And if we kind of like focus in and, and have a look on what we think is going to happen in the Asia Pacific, that very much mirrors that. So really highlighting the fact that moving forwards, a lot of the value growth and the value opportunity within TBA is going to come from spirits and RTDs. And that's where brand owners should be placing their attention and focus. So if we then drill into it a little bit more and look at TBA by region and category, we asked the question, where do we expect the vast majority of value growth to come from? So if we start at the top, and we won't go through everyone, but um, we see premium and above uh, national spirits in the Asia Pacific is kind of almost off the chart. And this is very much driven by the um, you know, premiumization in Baijiu. Conversely, we see further down um, that actually there'd be quite a lot of value decline expected um, in standard and below. So that's really showing the uh, switching that we're seeing and um, people trading up and that real premiumization drive within the category. Premium and above spirits in the USA are expected to perform particularly well. And that will very much be driven by um, agave, but then also American whiskies. We're expecting RTDs in North America to be uh, a lot of value in the category and that's partially because of the significant scale of RTDs in the American uh, channel but then also by the significant amount of investment and MPD that we're expecting to come through. 
We're also seeing beer come quite highly in terms of uh, pushing through on a value perspective, and that's very much uh, driven by the growth of craft and more niche products. So if we look at some of the key takeaways, you know, we really ended up talking about 21 um, being a story of premiumization and actually comparatively robust recovery. So we saw, you know, value growth was at 12%, so four times the volume growth rate. Um, premiumization, you know, even in terms of uh, really difficult economic times, um, that is still a conversation that is um, on the tip of everyone's tongue. So we've seen premium and evolved spirits perform very well. There's been a clear trend in the, um, you know, less but better uh, dynamic for still wine. And also Champagne recovered rapidly in 2021 and, and had an, an incredible year, um, also seeing potentially some issues with supply. We've talked a lot about the millennial shift. So we've seen a strong bounce back uh, in consumption, really supported by millennials. So a lot of trends that are underpinning that around premiumization, moderation, exploration. We're also seeing a lot of the LDA Gen Z values coming to the fore, so health and wellness, social responsibility, and also social inclusivity. We've talked a bit already about moderation. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of the volumes driven by beer, but wine and spirits are seeing continued uh, investment and customer interest. And that's not going to go away. You know, people really want to be able to be part of that drinking ritual, but to be able to do it in a way that suits them. Um, we talked about the RTD premium opportunity. So I think that's something that's going to be very interesting to, to watch over the next couple of years as we, um, as we see really clear differentiation and more premium products coming through in that space. And then obviously e-commerce, um, you know, growth has moderated slightly in 2021 post the pandemic boom, but very much now a core part of the channel mix. You know, we're seeing premium, fast growing categories tend to over index in terms of online sales. So it's going to be a very important uh, component of the future value pool. And then really the last point, is, you know, there's there's evidence that brand owners have um, passed on price increases already to retailers and that that's likely to be an ongoing dynamic. So I think the, the big question for 2022 is going to be, you know, will consumers accept these prices and continue to purchase the products that they have been, or will we start seeing elements of down trade? So that's definitely one that we'll be looking at closely um, for the rest of this year. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please do send them through via the platform and we will come back to you as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, um, you can look us up um, at our website, or if you want to drop us an email at any point, our email address is there. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to speaking with you again soon.